part of the offer. So a lot of you have stopped by the table and picked up a lot of the things I have about um, growing plants for hummingbirds. Please feel free to come back. If you haven't hit the table yet, and you can show me. Um, I have this one about how to attract hummingbirds. I have another one about creating the hummingbird friendly yard. And then there's one that I took offline from our wonderful cooperative extension service about um, plants for hummingbirds, which is just great. It makes it so easy. And there's a big wonderful thing about 13 fun facts. You've got to know about hummingbirds right away. Let me see. 13 jaw dropping facts about hummingbirds. So please feel free. I guess I said, I'm not real formal. I mean, I can. I am going to say this though. You really want hummingbirds. You need to fill your yard with flowers, flowers that attract them. They like the flowers that have tubes or tubular flowers. Um, nasturtiums are a good one. Petunias are another good one. And you know, you don't have to plant a whole yard. Maybe, maybe you're in a front, maybe you're in a condo, and all you have is a little balcony. Plant a pot full of petunias and have some regular fertilizer or it's they'll find them. And wouldn't it be fun if you're sitting in your condo in the living room and all of a sudden you look out and there's all these hummingbirds that you're between you that you're hung up on the porch. So. Native plants are better. We all know that. Um, and encourage your neighbors also to plant new plants. I mean, your plants are wonderful, but wouldn't it be nice if like three or four neighbors in a row all had a lot of plants like hummingbirds and honeybees and butterflies and all planted similar things. Um, it, would be, it would be wonderful. Now we're talk about who feeds hummingbirds. Oh, that's good. Okay. How many of you make your own, your own nectar? Oh, that's How many of you buy it? Okay, that's okay, fine. Oh, that's fine too. Okay. Um, the attractive hummingbirds brochure has an easy recipe. It's four parts water to one part sugar. Super simple. Not hard to make at all. Um, better for the hummingbirds. Better for the hummingbirds. You can store it up to a week in the fridge, but when you're filling your feeders in the, in the warm weather, you want to change it every three to four days, five days at the most, and then clean your feeder up really good. And there's directions on how to do that. We'll talk about it in a minute. But if it's really hot, and we do have some 95 degree days out here, let's be honest, we all know that, right? Every other day, because it molds and it mildews and it can make them awfully sick. All you need is a feeder that's got red on it. I have directions out on the table to how to make a, take a baby food jar and make a feeder. And you tie a red ribbon on it. And you tie it. The red of this not in here. You don't want red dye. More and more hummingbirds are dying from the red dye. So this is a very simple plastic feeder. It's the kind of basic feeder that we all have. But a lady in the back just showed me this feeder, which I've never seen until today. Is that awesome? And she was concerned about, don't they have to sit down to eat? And the answer is no, they do not have to sit down to eat. Because if you ask, actually watch them in your garden at the flowers, they don't sit down to eat. I just think this is so... And here the glass is great. So I think that's kind of cool. I don't know. These are fun. These are fun. And they come here, see it's red? And they sip right from here. I have something similar to this at my house. On this blown glass. For those of you who may have been kind of hanging around our tables out there, um, lots of people are talking to me about it. And so, the first, I lost 93 pounds of this. But the first thing, the first 20 pounds, I got a friend who said, at the first 20 pounds, I go out for dinner. I bought myself a blown glass. Bird, um, hummingbird feeder like this one of them, and it has this thing and it's beautiful like this and it looks like a um, the balloons that the hot air balloons so I just got treating myself and just too busy <laughs> so let me see so we talked about artificial nectar now the recommendation is if you're going to offer artificial nectar do it in May and then again in the fall I feed you around. I mean I like to see my, I mean I see my hummingbirds around the yard I like to see them right outside my kitchen window when I'm having breakfast in the morning. And I like to see them outside the kitchen window when I'm doing dishes at night, because I feed on either side of my kitchen. I just, I feed you around, and I just, you know, keep it clean. But I do make the nectar in fairly bulk. I use it, um, I store it in an old quart jar for milk, you know, <laughs> stick it right in the fridge, put the date on it, and I make it so I know how old it is. 
and that's what I use. And when I clean them out, um, I take them out and I clean them really good with hot water and just a drop of like Dawn dish detergent, give it a good shake, rinse and rinse and rinse. Sometimes if it's been really hot, I'll use a 10% um, solution of bleach and water and give it a good scrub a scrub and then really shake it good and rinse it out again. Then I let it air dry and I like to put them out on the porch in the sun to let it air dry because you can sanitize it. It doesn't say that anywhere, but I, it just is my thing. I use the sun a lot for my bee things to my bee parts as well. Okay. So basic needs of hummingbirds. They need perches, they need insects, they need water, they need cover, and they need plants. Space. Space. So perches. Usually, I don't put out any special perches for the birds. I mean, they kind of find them. I have some dead perch, dead twigs on top of my apple tree that overlooks a feeder, and he sits up there. I think it's the same bird because he does the same exact thing every year. He sits up there and waits for somebody else to come to the feeder, and he dive bombs them, squeaking all the way. It's like amazing. It really, really is. Some perches would be in the open. Others can be in protected areas, particularly when I think about the females who are in a protected area nesting. And sometimes that can be as simple as just stripping the leaves off of very thin branch. Remember, they're very light and very tawny, so they don't mean a great big branch like this. They mean something maybe that thick to, to perch on. Just you know, to give them some place well, to Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Ladies' Day. I have three more door prizes to announce. Our winners are Faye King, Helen Bonelli. Yeah, Faye was here. Um, and so Lorraine Polito. They, they perch frequently. That is Faye King, Helen Bonelli, and Lorraine Polito. If you're in the store, customer. come on back to the customer um, service desk so and uh, claim your prize. Thanks very much for joining us today. And also, when they take a bath, does so everybody know that honeybirds like to bathe? They like to shower? Mm -hmm. They do. And they like to go to a perch afterwards to kind of fuck the fig, fig, you know, feathers and clean up. So we talked about insects. They're a source of protein and fat. Spiders, small insects like flies, ants, bees, and beetles. I've never seen them eat a bee, but maybe the little native bees that I've been talking about at the table this um, today, that might be it. Water's fine for them. Um, very shallow. They can't use a deep bird bath, but they could use just a saucer that has a little bit of water in it like that. I like to put stones in all my low saucers like that for my birds, for my bees, and for my hummingbirds because I don't like to see them try to balance and dip in. Bees, if they balance and dip in, will drop and drown. They'll fall in and drown. They can't hold on. So they need a stone to perch on or a sponge. So I do shallow water like that. But what I really like to do is I like to run my sprinklers in my vegetable garden. Either 7 a.m. in the morning as the sun comes up or like 4 o'clock in the afternoon. It depends on what I'm doing. But once you start a, a system like that, let's say 7 a.m. every morning, they're out there waiting for you to turn those sprinklers on. Did you have seen this? Have a thing I have um, in my vegetable garden, I have um, thing, trellises and such for my beans. They sit on the top of the trellis and wait for you to turn the water on. And then they fly down to the floor. Similar to, probably in back where you can't see it, but similar to the sprinkler picture here. They do, they fly back and forth and take a shower. And then they go and they will, they will perch on top of one of the trellises to fluff. And you can see them fluffing. It's just, it's, but water is very important. Most of their water intake comes from nectar. But they still need, they still need some water to bathe because they like to bathe every single day. Sometimes they even fly through leaves that are covered with dew droplets like that. I've not seen it, but I read about it. Um, does that be on the ground or elevated? Yeah. Your, your little plate. Oh, that could be in the ground. I've seen them come down to the ground for that. Because I keep those all through my vegetable garden and out front of my flower garden in the sun for the bees, for the birds, for anything that wants a little bit of water, including toads and frogs. And I mean, I really garden for everybody. Will they bathe in soap water? I've never. Mm -hmm. I would be very surprised. I would be just shocked if they did. I think the salt would be good for their feathers because they they are not like water birds like gulls that have the extra oil. I would think that probably it's only fresh water for them. Where else they're getting their water? Yeah, I would think fresh water for them. I mean, they'll find places. They'll find places to take baths if they need to. 
cover we talked about, woodland edges, orchards, of course, our residential backyards with our gardens is probably one of their favorites, especially if we keep it up. Males defend about a quarter of an acre. And I was kind of surprised when I found that out. Um, and females protect just the immediate area right around the nest, which is, like I said, in the tree. They can live as long as 12 years, and typically it's three to five years. Um, they don't have a lot of natural predators. I think the worst predator is cats. Cats that get out, or cats that are out, and they can leap pretty high, cats, and they'll leap high enough to take them um, off. Of, if they're in a, on a flower, they can leap up and take them out of a flower area. So I think cats are probably the um, free-ranging domestic cats are probably the awful thing. Sometimes a, a frog, a large leaping leopard frog, which I don't think I've seen up here in Massachusetts. Where I don't know that we have leopard frogs up here. I've never seen that. Okay, good. Hmm? Oh, um, some, this says that what I, my, my, what I looked up said sometimes an American kestrel, which is a very small sparrow hawk, they call them sparrow hawk, and I really little, will take them. I suppose because they do eat birds, kestrels, I know that, but wow, that would be awful. Um, that long migration they do down to South America is probably one of the biggest, biggest ways that they um, die. But the biggest threat that we have to hummingbirds and bees and all of our natural creatures is what we're doing to the habitat that we're, we're paving it over. Where, you know, there's lots of habitat and nectar rich wetland. And just do that organization that they're doing. We're all seeing organization, also known as Crawl, come up here, even here into the So, um, So, what can you do as an individual? Gosh, I'm only one person. Gosh, what can I do? You can make your garden a habitat for hummingbirds, but you can make it a habitat for all of the other creatures too, like other bees and that sort of thing. And encourage your friends and neighbors to do the same thing. The major one thing that we all can do a better job of is not using poisons and pesticides in our environment. I have another soapbox for that. <laughs> but um, now that we know, it's reminiscent to me of 1962 when I went off to college and our biology professor handed us a book called Science of Spray by Rachel Carson, and it was required reading. We had two weeks to read it. And we got to it. And we started rereading it the other night. Oh, yeah. Not so different, is it? We listened to her initially, but then over the years, we stopped listening. Now we have things instead of DDT, we have neonics. So though they're doing a better job of getting neonics out of the I didn't hear what you said. Unless you have to. Excuse me. I'm sorry. I didn't hear what you said. What book? What book? Rachel Carson's. Oh, Simon Rachel Spring. Carson. Okay. Yeah. So we need to do a better job of getting those pesticides out of our environment. Um, there's just there's other ways to do things as far as like, getting rid of some of the pesticides. And that's So. Oh. I wanted to talk a little bit about, because I thought this was fascinating, how hummingbirds and flowers co-evolved. Some flowers are ornithophilus, which means that they are adapted for pollination by birds rather than by insects, wind, or water. So in this case, pollen gets on the hummingbird's beak as it probes the flower to drink the nectar. And then of course, like any other pollinator, as it goes from flower to flower, it takes the pollen with it. So the structure of these flowers that have the tubulars are almost difficult for insects to get into. I mean, how many bees wouldn't do it? So of more than the 30 native species of flowering plants used by ruby throats in their breeding range, at least 19 of them are this ornithophilus. So some of those would be like the scarlet bee balm, cardinal flowers, columbine, all tubulars, daylilies, lupins, Foxglove. Mm -hmm. Think about the structure of these. Hollyhocks, mm -hmm. one of my favorite flowers. Petunias. I was talking about petunias earlier. They're all tubular. Honeybees don't have a long enough tongue. Bumblebees don't have a long enough tongue. But these, these guys do. And they locate their food by eye. That's why red is their favorite color. They don't have a sense of smell. Birds don't smell. That's why we don't want the squirrels eating your sunflower seeds. Just sprinkle a whole lot of cayenne pepper to it. Mm. And trust me, the squirrels don't like it. They take one bite and yep. it doesn't get in my nose. I mix birds, it. I birds mix will eat it. Birds will eat it. They can't smell it. It doesn't bother them at all. Yeah. So. 
So, unless they're from New Orleans. It's like single blossom flowers, not double blossoms, and that's true of for every single solitary insect that uses nectar at all. Double blossoms are very hard for them to get to the nectar if they even have nectar. A lot of the double blossom flowers do not have nectar. When you're buying seeds or buying plants, check the tag to be sure that they're not a pollen-free plant. There are a lot of sunflowers now that are pollen-free, which I just discovered a couple of years back. Um, I mean, it's okay for those people that are allergic, but for our insects that are pollinating, it doesn't help them at all, um, like moths and bees and other insects like that. If you can plant large clumps of flowers in your yard, that's a good thing to do. Um, you, when you're up there, we've all seen how fast a hummingbird goes. When you're going that fast, a bigger clump catches your eye quicker. Um, and same thing with, with any kind of bird or any kind of pollinator, a larger clump of something. And it doesn't have to be 100 acres. It doesn't even have to be 6 or 8 feet. It could be 2 feet by 3 feet. It could be 8 flowers instead of 3 flowers. Just something clumped together. Um, we all know about shorter plants in the front, medium plants in the top. Or if you're in a circle garden, taller in the middle, and then the, everybody's nodding their head. You don't, anybody not understand what I'm talking about? Not only is it more pleasing to us, it looks better to us. But for the, for the um, pollinators, it's easier too. Because if they land on a flower, let's say they go in for a lower, a shorter flower that's among medium or tall flowers. And here comes a bird after that butterfly or that insect. They can't get out of it. So better to stun it if you can. That way they, they have plenty of room above them. You want to give them room above them. Um, No, I can get another one. Oh, oh are you sure? Yeah. Good, then I'll buy that one. <laughs> <laughs> are things like the mini petunias, have we all seen the mini petunias? And I think they're so cute. Calabrachia, I just think they're so great. I used those in some of my window boxes this year, and I had hummingbirds right at my window box, right on top of my kitchen window when I was eating breakfast. It was really good. Wow, yeah, this is cool. I like those flowers. Can I just say one thing? Absolutely. You can say when, you when you do um, flowers, like I love to do flowers just for hummingbirds, but if you have a cat that goes outside, make sure it's somewhere where the cat can't get to. Like I used to have a deck where the cat could get to the flowers, you know. Now I, have, I don't have a cat anymore. But um, you have to be so careful because... So just be careful of that where you put them. I think for us cats are probably the worst predators right now. I know. I can think of. Anyway, I've never seen a hawk take out any birds. I suppose they do, and I've just never seen it. But I would think the free-ranging cats are the biggest, biggest issue. We have that for our birds, and free-ranging cats. Um, it, it breaks my heart when I find a, a bird sitting on my front porch that I know my neighbor's cat will by me, I don't know. <laughs> so, begonias, fuchsias, geraniums, road geraniums, not the ones we put at the cemetery. Nasturtium is my favorite plant. Petunias we talked about. Phlox is another favorite plant. Phlox are really great for you. Zinnias, coral bells, which is Uchera. Milkweed, believe it or not, they love milkweed. Columbines, which is a wildflower. Jewelweed, who, who does not have jewelweed? Mm -hmm. I have so much jewelweed, I've been pulling it out by the clumps the last couple of years. It really spreads. Um, it's good for flowers. poison ivy. Hmm? Jewelweed's good for poison ivy. I know jewelweed's good for poison ivy, but not the <laughs> Then I could probably treat the, my whole town with poison ivy <laughs> that much. Um, how about some questions? I have a question. Fuchsia for three years in a row, but in my hummingbird feeder is distant from the fuchsia, and I thought they would go to one and then the other. Only the fuchsia. Take down, take down your hummingbird feeder and see what happens. What's that? Take down your hummingbird feeder and see what happens. Uh, well, I like the feeder because it's right in front of my window. I hear you, but if you get her used to get them used to using the fuchsia, 
and you see that they come into the future every day for three or four oh, days, then try hanging it back out again and see if I lose both. Uh, I see. Okay. I would take take down the one they prefer yeah. to see if you can get them to use the other one because then that one won't be there anymore. Right. Yes. Do they like hydrangeas? Not that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I could be wrong in that. I didn't see that as a mm -hmm. list. Um, wait a minute. Let me, let me see what the extension says about that. That would be a shrub, right? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> Let me see. We've got hawthorns, rhodes, azaleas, shadbush, apples, tulip tree. I'm not seeing hydrangea. Rhodes. Maybe they don't have Rhodes a tube. Sharon is a good one. Maybe they don't have a tube, tubular. Maybe it's not a nectary that they can get to. That could be. Nectary is, the nectary is the, Every flower has a nectary, and it's a tube that goes down into the base where the nectar is stored. It's called a nectary. That's why red clover, for example, honeybees can't access it, but bumblebees can because bumblebees' tongues are long. Now you're um, do, when, when the hummingbirds make their babies, and the babies come to the feeder, do, Last question, right here. Do, you, do you know? I never can tell if it's a baby or not. Sometimes I can't either. Sometimes so the babies will have little black spots. Right there. <coughs> oh. And I just have to put the word by it. I knew what kind of was true. <laughs> Are you wearing Oh, you're welcome. We can continue this back at the table if you want. Thank you. Everything's at the table. All that's the table. Yeah, right next to the table. Yeah, that's my table right next to the table. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you all for coming.